I love tools. And I've always loved tools. I love how they feel in my hands. I love the work they help me do. I love the life they help me build. I guess you could say that tools have always been part of my life. My father gave me this one, this old box planer, when I was old enough to help him in the shop, and I, in turn, gave it to my son when he was old enough to help me. My name is Yosef. You would call me Joseph, and this is my story. I learned my trade from my father. He was what we called a harash, that is, a tecton in the Greek language, or in your language, you would call it a carpenter. But he was much more than a man who just hammered nails for a living. My father was a craftsman. A harash is an artisan, one who creates, one who builds. My father did know how to work with wood. He could cut and shape and smooth wood like it was butter. He could make chairs and tables and doors, all kinds of things out of wood. But he also knew how to make things out of copper and iron. He knew how to build with stone. He could make the foundations of a home and build most of the home with his own hands. My father would often stop as we walked along the way somewhere, and he would point out to me something that most people would walk right on by, maybe a finely made stone stairway or a perfectly square door frame, maybe even the the great pillars of a Roman building. He would say, stop, look, son, look at that. He would say, aharash, designed and built that. A harash honors God with his work, he would say. My father was a good man. He taught me how to work hard. He taught me how to be a good husband and a good father, just by his own example. When I think of my father, I think of the words of the prophet who said, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That was my father. He taught me to love God, El Shaddai, the Almighty One, the God of our people. Every day before he left for work, he would gather us kids together and lead us in reciting the great words of the Torah. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And of course, as a family, we observed the Sabbath, the Shabbat, every week. On Friday evenings, we would go to the synagogue. We would worship there together. And then Saturdays was the day just to stay at home together as family and to rest. In fact, Saturday was the only day my father would allow himself to take a nap. And we would joke with him that as he got older, his naps grew a little longer. We made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem every year for the great Passover celebration. I remember the awe I felt as a boy the first time I saw the great temple and all the people, thousands of people bringing their sacrifices of worship to Yahweh, God, Jehovah. And I remember my father purchasing, buying the two white turtle doves that he would offer as his sacrifice on behalf of our family. And I remember he would complain. He complained about the prices they would charge for the animals. He he complained about the money changes. And I didn't understand as a boy what he was talking about. But later, when I became a man, I understood why he complained. And I especially remember the Passover when I was 12 years old. Because that was my bar mitzvah celebration when I became a man. And for the first time, I was allowed to open the great scrolls of the Torah and read aloud the words of the Lord before the men of my family. I'll never forget. My father was not a scholar. He wasn't a rabbi. But he was a man of God. And he taught me what it meant to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. He taught me what it meant to be a righteous man. So I grew up working with my hands, like my father, and I learned from him all the tools of the trade. I learned to build, to build chairs and tables and walls, things that were real, things that would last, sturdy things, useful things. And I can honestly say I never really wanted to be important or rich or famous. I only dreamed of maybe one day having my own shop with my own tools 
a wife and a house full of children. Maybe I would be so blessed as to have a son one day who could share my work the way I, I shared my father's work in his shop. Well, it turns out that some of my very favorite memories are of working in my shop with my boys and teaching them to use the same tools my father taught me because the Almighty El Shaddai did bless me. He blessed me so much. First with a beautiful wife, I'll tell you her story in a minute, and he did give me a house full of children. I had five sons and two daughters. Our boys' names were Yeshua, Jacob, Yossi, Jude, and Shimon. Our girls were Miriam and Salome. They were all beautiful gifts, each one. We treasured them. But Yeshua, my oldest, he was different. And I know you're here tonight because of him, and I'm here to tell you how he came into our lives. I fell in love only once in my whole life. Have you ever been in love? Her name was Mary, and she was just 14 when we met. And as strange as it may sound to you, our marriage was arranged before we even spoke to each other for the very first time. Oh, I knew who Mary was. She, her family lived in the next village over, and I'd see her in the synagogue every now and then, or maybe in the marketplace with her mother. I was 10 years older than she, and so I always thought of her as just being a little girl until that day when I noticed she wasn't a little girl anymore. I watched her from a distance, how she walked, how she was patient when she helped her mother do the shopping, how she managed to carry those baskets and those heavy water jars with such grace. I would try to arrange my breaks from work just so I could get to the market when I thought she might be there so I could catch a glimpse of her with her friends. And one time I was close enough and I heard her laugh out loud with her friends and I knew that day that I loved her. I was a bit shy, so our tradition of arranging marriages fit me just fine. And when the time came for me to take a wife, my parents sat me down and asked me if there was anyone special I had in mind. Now, it was their right to arrange my marriage, but it was common practice for parents to ask their children if they had their preferences. So I pretended to hem and haw, and eventually when I said I kind of did have someone in mind. They asked me her name, and when I said Mary, they, all, they both began to smile and nod as if they already knew. I guess I really hadn't hid my interest all that well. My mother knew Mary's mother just from living in neighboring villages for their whole lives. My father had done some business with her father. One thing led to another. When the time was right, my father made the official wedding proposal to her father. In our way of doing things, he was expected to pay what was called a bride price, a dowry. He had to offer material wealth. And I don't know what he offered, but evidently, and I was very glad, it turned out to be enough. And the official arrangement of marriage was made. Then and only then was our first meeting, Mary and myself, allowed to take place. You might call it a date. Not really, because her mother was there as chaperone. Talk about awkward. What do you say to the woman who's going to become your wife, but who is still a stranger to you? I wanted so much to say, you're so beautiful tonight. But her mother's st sitting right there, so all I could manage to stammer out in my nervousness was beautiful weather we're having. I thought to myself, how can I, not, how can I be so foolish? How can, why can't I say the right thing? But she looked at me in that way I came to know so well, and she just smiled and said, indeed it is. Indeed it is. She had a way of knowing what I most wanted to say, even when I struggled to find the right words. Well, I guess uh, her mother was pleased enough because just like that, we were betrothed. We had a big party to celebrate the arrangement, and the whole village celebrated with us. Betrothal in our culture meant that Mary and I uh, we're legally bound to one another. She would be mine and I would be hers, just like a marriage. But we would not live together, nor would we give ourselves to each other until the wedding ceremony took place. And among our people, the betrothal time usually lasted about a year. And it would be the longest year of my life, not just because I had to wait for my bride, but for all the things that would happen to us in that year.
It was my family's responsibility to plan and pay for the wedding, so while my mother and father began to plan, I just began to dream, and I imagined the life that we would make together. First, I'd build a small home, nothing fancy, but, but adequate. With my father and brother's help, we could do most of it ourselves. And then I would go to work, probably in my father's shop, and I'd work with him until I could either afford to open my own shop or I would take over from him. And I'd work hard. We wouldn't have a lot. We wouldn't be rich, but we'd have enough. And during the betrothal period, Mary and I were allowed to get together about once a week, usually with one of our mothers present. It was very important in our culture for our relationship, even though we were betrothed, to always appear appropriate and proper. So one of our mothers was usually with us. But every now and then, we would manage to find time alone. Usually in the evenings after dinner time, we'd find a private place. And at first it was a little awkward and uncomfortable, but gradually we began to get more comfortable with each other. We began to share our dreams of what life would be like. And those precious times together became the highlight of my week. Now you may find this curious, but we were careful even then even when we were alone, not to embrace or to ever touch each other inappropriately. In fact, holding hands was all we would ever really do, but that was enough for us. About three months after we were betrothed, Mary went away for a little while. She went to visit her cousin Elizabeth because Elizabeth was expecting a baby. And this was big news in the whole family because Elizabeth, although she was older than Mary, had not been able to conceive and not been able to have a child. And in our culture, in our way of thinking, that was called being barren. And there were whispers that she may be barren, and that was seen as a curse among our people. So it was great news, and Mary went to help her cousin, and she stayed with her for about two months. I missed her terribly during those weeks, but I understood. So I just spent longer hours working and tried to do some extra projects and save a little extra money because our new life was coming closer day by day. So when she finally came home after those couple of months, I couldn't wait to see her again. And we met in our favorite place under some olive trees in kind of a park near her home. But before I could even tell her how much I missed her, Mary spoke. And she said, Yosef, I thought that was unusual because she had begun calling me a nickname, Yossi, weeks before. But this time it was formal. Yosef, she said, we have to talk. I noticed that the tone of her voice was different. At first I thought maybe just because we, because we haven't talked for a while. But then I noticed it was as if she were speaking from somewhere far away. Her next words I can still hear echoing in my mind. She said, I'm going to have a baby. At first, I thought I had misheard her. I thought she had said, someday I'm going to have a baby. I said, excuse me? And then she said it again, slowly and softly, as if she knew her words would cut like a knife. She said, I'm going to have a baby, Yosef. How can I tell you what those words meant? How can I tell you what those words felt like? What they meant was that my bride, my beloved, had been with another, had been known by another because I knew it wasn't me. All those months I'd been so careful with the desire growing within me. I wanted our relationship to be pure, to be righteous before God. It meant that either she had been taken against her will, and if that were so, I would vow to take revenge on any dog of a man who would dare do such a thing, even at the price of my own life. Or it meant that while she was away, she had given herself to another by her choice. It meant that she had been unfaithful to her vow, which in our world meant she was an adulteress. What did I feel? What would you feel? Shock? Numb? Mm -hmm. Rage? Oh yeah. Sadness? All of that. It felt like the time my neighbor's donkey kicked me when I was a boy, only worse. That was just a bruise on the outside of my body. This was a, a terrible ache somewhere deep inside. And Mary waited for a moment for her words to sink in, and then she reached out for my hand, but I pulled it back. For the first time, I didn't want her to touch me. 
By now, tears are streaming down her face, and she said, but Joseph, Joseph, you have to know it's not what you think. I thought, how can you know what I think? How can it not be what I think? But I didn't say a word, and I didn't even look at her. I couldn't. She kept talking, almost in a whisper, maybe so no one would hear. She told me a story, a crazy story, an insane story, of how she had had a dream or a vision, something, And an angel of God, she said, had appeared to her. And she said, the angel was like a man, only much larger, much bigger, too bright to look at directly. And it made her feel terribly afraid, she said. But the angel, she said, spoke to her by name, said Mary, and told her that she would have a child. And that the child would not be by a man, but by the Spirit of God. And then she looked at me, she said, Joseph, Joseph, please believe me. I have not been with a man. The baby growing inside me is of the Lord, she said. <laughs> oh, how I wanted to believe her. Her voice and her eyes told me she was not lying, but my heart and my ears heard something else. I wanted to believe she had not been known by another man. I wanted to believe she was still pure. I wanted to believe she still belonged to me. But how could I? A dream? An angel? A baby without a man involved? How was I supposed to believe that? Would you believe it? And how was I going to tell my friends? <laughs> what was I going to tell my friends? And my parents? What was I going to do? What could I do? So I just sat for a long time saying nothing. No words. I don't know how long it was, but it grew dark and cold. Finally, I told her just to go home. Just go home and stay there. Don't say a word to anyone about anything, I said. I need time. And I left. I spent most of that night just walking the streets of our little village, back and forth, back and forth, thinking, praying, just churning inside, struggling to keep myself from cursing out loud. I saw the warm glow of, of fires in the homes, the tiny homes that line the streets of our village. And in every home, I imagined there would be a, a father and a mother, a husband and a wife, and maybe some young children. And there was warmth and there was joy. That dream that had seemed so close. Now, so far. I knew I had to tell my parents. My father had already paid the bride price. He had already put money down on the celebration. He'd taken on extra jobs just to earn enough money to be able to provide the kind of wedding he wanted for his son, a feast our whole family could be proud of. He would be deeply offended. And my mother... My mother had already started the plan. She talked incessantly of decorations and food and music and all that still needed to be done. She loved every minute of it. Her heart would be broken. I had to tell my brothers. I think I dreaded that the most because I knew what they were going to say. They loved me, and I believe they loved Mary too, but they also loved El Shaddai. They loved God. And they believed he was holy. And they loved what they believed to be his law. And they were going to be angry. They would tell me that I had no choice but to go to the rabbi and divorce her publicly. I had to make sure that everyone, the whole community knew that this child was not my responsibility. That I was not the one who sinned here. Adultery was a serious sin in the eyes of our faith. In the eyes of our community. The law of Moses commanded that such a woman, an adulteress, could be stoned to death as punishment. That wasn't often practiced anymore, but it was possible, according to the law. But despite everything, despite her obvious sin against me and against our God, I just couldn't bring myself to publicly shame her in front of the whole community. How can I explain it? I still loved her. Hurt, yes, 
beyond words. Angry, yes, but I still loved her. So as I walked that night, I decided. I decided there would be no rabbis. There would be no public divorce. There would be nothing said publicly at all. I would divorce her, but I would do it quietly, privately. I would let her family send her away somewhere, maybe to her, her cousin Elizabeth, or somewhere where she could have the baby in safety. Maybe she could start a new life. Maybe she could become another man's wife. As for me, I would deal with my parents' disappointment. I would deal with the anger my brothers would have. I would deal with the judgment and ridicule of my friends and all the whispering that would go on behind my back, and I knew it would. I could handle all that. But I would protect her. I decided to protect Mary, whatever the cost. I would do justice, but I would also love mercy. I just thought that was the right thing to do. And then that night, as I tried to sleep, I tossed and turned as if I was in a great wrestling match with God himself. My mind raced even in my sleep. And if I hadn't had a dream, I wouldn't have thought I even slept at all. But I did dream. And I had the kind of dream that was so real that when you wake up, you're not sure it was a dream at all. Have you had that kind of dream? And in my dream, I was alone in a strange place surrounded by great stone buildings and there were fearsome faces carved on the walls of these buildings and there was a river dark and deep running nearby and I heard my name being called Joseph, Joseph and I turned at the sound of the voice and I saw a great golden altar and there before the altar was standing a figure Tall, taller than a man, much bigger than a man, dressed all in white, so bright like the sun that I had to turn my face away. But when I looked back, the beings, the creatures, eyes shone with the kind of light that was at once terrifying and somehow comforting. And when he spoke, his voice was like rushing water. Joseph, he said. I said, here I am. He said, Joseph, son of David. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Ruach Elohim, the Holy Spirit of God. I took a step toward the throne, but he raised his hand as if to say, come no closer, and I backed up again. Mary, your bride, he said, will bear a son, and you will give him the name Yeshua, because he will save his people from their sins. As the prophet wrote, Look, the virgin has conceived and will bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel. God is with us. And at these words, the dark river began to rise, and the water began to swirl around my feet and come up toward my, my hips and my waist, and I began to sink into the waves, and I could hear myself crying out, Save me, save me, and I woke up. Do you know what it is to hear the voice of God? Have you heard his voice? Because once you hear his voice, you never forget what that sounds like. At first you think you might be imagining things. And then you think you might be losing your senses altogether. And then you feel fear. A terrible fear. And then you feel a presence. And the presence is heavy like a weight. And it surrounds you and it overwhelms you. And then you feel peace. Certainty and peace. When I woke up, I was drenched in sweat. Exhausted, terrified, exhilarated all at once. And I remembered and what I remembered was Mary describing to me a dream that she said she had. A dream in which a bright creature and angels, he said, said words to her like, Do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. The Holy Spirit, the Ruach Elohim, has come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you, and you will conceive and bear a son. She had told me, and I had not believed her. I was so angry. I didn't even listen to the words she spoke. And now I had received the same message. Could it be? Could it be that the same angel of God 
had visited me in the night that had visited her? Could it be that the child in her womb was of the Ruach Elohim, the breath of God? Could it be that this child was the one promised by the prophets centuries before? Could it be? And I found myself on my knees next to my bed, my forehead on the floor, and I found myself repenting. I repented. I repented of my disbelief. I repented of my anger toward my bride, toward Mary. I repented of my anger and distrust of God, and I wept with a kind of relief and wonder that I had never known before. I had no idea what would come of it all. I had no idea why God had chosen her of all women. I had no idea why he'd chosen me of all men. I had no idea how I was ex going to explain this to my family or to my friends or to my brothers. I had no idea what would happen to the child that Mary was now carrying, but I did know this. I knew what I would do. I would obey. I would do what I was told to do. I knew with everything in my being that the Most High had spoken. I knew with all that was in me, Mary had told me the truth. I knew that I would take her to be my wife. I knew the child would be a boy. I did not know everything I was going to be asked to do. I didn't. I didn't know about the long walk to Bethlehem. I didn't know that King Herod would try to kill our little boy. I didn't know about the years we would spend as refugees in Egypt. I didn't know everything a child's life would bring. I didn't know the unusual wisdom he would display even as a young man at the age of 12. I didn't know all he would do and all he would say. I didn't yet know how he would have to suffer. I didn't know that because of him, you wouldn't have to bring sacrifices to God for your sin. I didn't know that he would atone even for my sin. But I knew that he was God's son. And I knew that he would be my son. And I knew that his name would be Jesus. Jesus.